Welcome to the fourth episode of Black and Azul. I am your host, Joel Soria, accompanied by no one else than Alex Morgan. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Joel. I'm excited to be here. Here to unpack a lot about the San Jose Earthquakes past week and current week heading into Saturday's match against the New York Red Bulls. We'll be talking about last week's match against Minnesota United. Words from Matias Almeida, elaborate on the Earthquakes current state, that and much more in the fourth episode of Black and Azul. So, Alex, 3-0 lopsided defeat against Minnesota United. The Quakes were looked bleak at times, uh, absent-minded, and obviously things really just didn't go well. The fans were booing. Uh, not all that great for San Jose. Yeah, fans are booing, and rightfully so. Um, that was uh, one of the worst ever defeats for San Jose at Avaya Stadium. I believe there was uh, two others in 2017. Uh, they lost four into the Chicago Fire. Uh, that was sort of the, the low point um, of that season. And 2015, they lost 5-2 to the LA Galaxy. Um, but other than that, this is the worst defeat they've ever suffered uh, at Avaya. You know, we, we, we talked about this, uh, th this match before we got on air. And, and I guess the, what I picked up from it, especially after Adrian Thiet's, uh, uh comments mm -hmm. wh which are were very revealing of the state of the of Minnesota United is is the dichotomy that we that we saw uh, on Saturday where here we have uh, Adrian Heath you know talking about how his team um, you know was in in dire need of of major players of of game changers who were going to make Minnesota a competitor mm -hmm. within the league. And here you have Matias Almeida living Heath's past in a sense where, you know, they, they don't, I guess it, it, it's fair to say that they don't have the quality to compete. Is that, you think I'm, I'm mistaken there? Well, they certainly have, haven't made the same moves that Minnesota have. Both, both teams were uh, at very low points uh, at the end of last season. Both had uh, some of the worst defenses in the league. Minnesota went over the off season and they made uh, very smart, I, I would almost say conservative moves. They brought in known quantities like Alonzo in the midfield uh, and Dopara at the back. Players that they knew would bring them success, and they have. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in their first two games. You know, San Jose, on the other hand, have had uh, a, you know, a major transformation. And uh, there are a lot of unknowns so far. Um, you know, Jesse Fiorinelli and, and Almeida's recruiting strategy has to been to bring in uh, you know, relatively unknown players from Latin America, uh, in Europe, and other parts of the world that might be diamonds in the rough. Um, but the, the flip side of that is that, um, you know, it, it's hard to predict how well they perform. And, and, it, and it's certainly been hard for the team to, to gel as a unit so far. Um, and I think we're still, we're still seeing this team uh, in San Jose uh, at the start of the process of rebuilding. Absolutely. I, looking at looking at the observing the match, uh, you know, from from our perspective mm -hmm. in the press box and and seeing the way that the the players are trying to execute Matias's style, which we know is peculiar. It, it's it's unique to the San Jose Earthquakes and and it, it's it's the anomaly in the league. Mm -hmm. But you know, just looking at it and and looking at the bigger picture, looking at at it from a, a 30, 35,000 uh, foot view. To me personally, this team didn't look better than than the way that they played with with Miguel Starre, where you know there was disparity in in Adavaya Stadium, a lot of empty seats, the team lacked cohesion, uh, the 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 players on the field demonstrated that same uh, mm -hmm. absent mind. That, that they did with Mikel Stari, the, the low efforts, the, the no heart, the no spirit. Uh, you know, you have players like Aníbal Godoy and Harold Cummings not going after the Panamanians, but, you know, they're not making the runs. Uh, they, they're, they're causing, uh, you know, letting goals in. And like Harold Cummings did, he, he gave in that own goal. And, and you know, the, the bigger picture, in the bigger picture, things are just really not coming along. I mean... Just in terms of these first two games, this start to the start of this season has been worse 
than any San Jose start since uh, 2008, I believe. Uh, and you know, if they lose again to the New York Red Bulls this next weekend, uh, it'll be their worst start since um, 1998. So in terms of results, it hasn't been there. I would say that I think uh, the performances, um, y you can see the positives. You can see uh, the things that Almeida's trying to do. You started talking about his uh, aggressive man marking system. At times that's worked well and you can see sort of this shape start to come together, this team start to come together. Um, but it will take time to start talking, I guess, about uh, the man marking system that they had. You know, at times it looks good. There have been times uh, when it, it, it has, uh, if you're looking at the Minnesota game, it successfully shut down Minnesota for, for large portions of the game. I think they were rather unlucky to concede early in the second half um, with a handball for, for a penalty for Minnesota, and, and then it unraveled from there. But if you look at the first half, um, there were times when, when, when the man marking system worked. Uh, your thoughts, Joel? Yeah, I, I guess I coincide with you there in that aspect. Uh, if you look at the 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 chart, like the interval chart, there are you know gaps within the game where the earthquakes obviously have dictated the pace of the game, and the possession numbers don't lie either, right? Mm -hmm. For the past two games, the earthquakes have controlled possession, have had the have had the opportunity to dictate the flow of the game, the pace of the game, to get you know the service that they need to, you know, to try and, and implement the style that they want to implement. Uh, but, you know, to me, the reality is, is that the, the team just doesn't have that, that final, that final spark, that final flair that is going to eventually win the San Jose Earthquake games. Uh, but, you know, like you said, there, there have been a, a couple positives. And, and I think some of those positives are uh, Jutson, obviously the player mm. that they brought in from Avai, from the Brazilian Second League. Another one I would say, and I guess I'd have to coincide with you, is, is Cristian Espinosa. Mm -hmm. He's still missing what Cristian Espinosa was known for earlier in, in his early days at Huracan, which is really finishing inside the box or making sure that he makes that last lethal pass mm -hmm. before you know the ball ends up in the back of the net. A and then another one is Daniel Vega, who I, I feel w was was done wrong by the scoreboard at the end of the night. He, mm -hmm. he was, the earthquakes, you know, lone bright spot in the first half had had some some excellent saves, and I know he was uh, a, a big talking point when he first signed. A lot of people were critical of that signing, uh, but I said it all along. You know, this is a player that on May that truly trust. He he's a player with integrity, and, and overall, he's a player with with a lot of leadership qualities. Yeah, I think uh, sorry, Vega was one of the outstanding performers. Uh, from from the Minnesota game, he had a couple key saves in the first half that kept the Quakes in the game. They could have uh, conceivably been down by two or two or three goals uh, in the first half. I think, as you mentioned, Espinosa had another strong performance. Um, when I was watching the game live, uh, I wasn't that impressed. But when I went back and watched the tape again, uh, I think his service to Wondolowski was very good. Um, Wondolowski talked after the first game about not getting enough. Uh, low balls into the middle. A lot of the service that he got was high and in the air. Uh, and Wander really thrives on those uh, low balls across the box that he can sort of ghost in behind and, and find space to finish. But he wasn't getting that service. Um, against Minnesota, Espinosa started to get him that service. You had a ball uh, early on in the game. Uh, I think it was Espinosa, uh, or, or maybe it was Lima. Either way, uh, that was cut back. Wondolowski shot it over. Um, you had another, another ball at the end of the first half. The Quakes hit the post. Um, and you had, obviously, Wando had the chance uh, in this, in, late on in the game, and he, he fluffed his lines. Um, but Espinosa's service has been very good. Um, I think one of the problems with San Jose is that I don't really know how this team is supposed to score. Right? You have Wondolowski who wants service in the area, and Espinosa has been providing some of that service, but otherwise, on the other side, Rocco is really not... He, he, his role is not to provide service, and uh, Lopez hasn't been able to get forward enough. I mean, in, in one hand, defensively, you could argue that he's getting forward too much, but he hasn't had that many opportunities to overlap Vaco because Vaco plays more centrally. Yeah. Vaco is not a winger. Um, you know, in, in past years, uh, you knew how the Quakes were sort of going to score. You knew that it was going to be Shea Salinas or, or another winger uh, bombing down the wing and cutting it back to Wondolowski to finish. Um, this year, that's not been happening as much as it needs to be happening. And 
you know, if that's not Almeida's uh, main game plan, uh, I'm not sure what is, honestly. I'm not sure. You have Erickson through the middle, but against Minnesota, he was largely ineffective. Um, and and I, I'm not sure what you think, Joel, about, about their attack, um, but I don't see how this team uh, is properly set up to, to score goals. Yeah, I, I, I said this before on, on previous podcasts. Uh, the Infinity NBC podcast had me on just yesterday, and I was speaking about this. Uh, Wondolowski has been absent. He, he's been missing in the attack for the past two games. I, I think it would be foolish for us to say that that's not the case. That is most certainly the case, and I guess I would agree with you as well with Vaco. He he doesn't flourish on the left side. He hasn't flourished on either wing. Hmm. The man flourishes either directly behind the striker or in a creative 10 roll where he falls a little farther behind into the center line and starts to create from there. Uh, you know, the, the, the reality here is, is is that, you know, this team is trying to implement a very pragmatic style, uh, uh, something more in depth, something with a with a clear stamp on it. And the Earthquakes haven't been known for that. They've played these erratic, uh, rudimentary styles that, you know, Dominic Kinnear played. No offense to him. It worked, but it's it was a it, it was a different stage in MLS. The league has evolved a lot more, and it's going to take st styles like the one that Almeida is trying to implement in order to be effective, to be, you know, well-known, not only probably in MLS, but also just continentally. And, and I think that's that's the direction that the team is trying to take. Obviously, it's going to take time. It's going to take the players as well. Uh, I think we both can agree on that. I don't think they have the players to suit to best suit Matias Almeida. They don't have those players. We were talking about the attack. They don't have those players to, to make genius runs to, you know, to get the fans roaring. You know, we, we've, we've seen it before. I mean, we, we've seen Baco make make a good case for himself last year. But this year, in, in, in the position that he's playing and what he's shown in the last couple of games, it's not. it doesn't look like it's going to be enough this year. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, I think, that Almeida's new style is pragmatic. I would disagree, and I'd say it's rather ambitious the way he's trying to play. And uh, thus far, he's been overly ambitious, and the risks that the man marking has posed have not worked. And I don't see how, uh, I, I don't really see the benefits that they've had either. Um, you talked about early, in, there was talk early in preseason that the idea was to win the ball back quickly, a la Barcelona and be able to press hard when you lose the ball and get it back and have quick transitions. But you really, we really haven't seen quick transitions from this from this team so far. We haven't, I, I have yet to see really, really uh, collective high pressure. Mm -hmm. I think we've been seeing a lot of obviously man marking pressure at times that calls for center backs to, to march over to the center line, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been what a lot of the quote unquote pundits made it to be. Uh, anyways, that that was it. That was a three 0 loss for the San Jose Earthquakes. Uh, Matias Almeida had a couple of words to say uh, after the game. Let's let's listen to those. Sí, yo creo que están en todo su derecho, porque cuando uno paga una entrada tiene derecho a su protesta y a su análisis. En el fútbol todos son entrenadores y todos son ex jugadores. La gran mayoría de los hombres. Eh, Nosotros vivimos de esto y evidentemente trabajaremos más para corregir eh, los errores nuestros. Prometer nunca prometí nada, simplemente yo trabajo, trabajo, soy honesto, no vengo a robar, ni nunca lo hice ni nunca lo haré. Eh, sí, a, a dedicarme con amor, con pasión y esperando que el resultado cambie, por, primero para la felicidad de estos jugadores que sé que lo sufren, Eh, a la dirigencia que es la que nos da la posibilidad de trabajar y, y bueno por consecuencia a la gente que es la que la que viene siempre y, y hoy día nos está obteniendo esa felicidad que, que queremos tenga telling words by Matias Almeida the fans have the right to protest he is not here to steal very, very loaded words by Matias Almeida there. Speaking of the divided fan base that we're seeing, mm -hmm. you know, on a regular basis on social media, I guess you can say the same about in the stadium, given the fact that some fans are just not showing up. 
Yeah, I, I would say his comments are a defensive posture. Um, you don't often hear a manager um, offer up that he's not here to steal, right? Yeah. It, it's a defensive posture, and and you know to some extent, I I, I think that he he sort of has to justify his 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 approach after two consecutive consecutive losses. Uh, you can tell he's feeling the pressure. I think for the I don't think I've ever seen this before, but after the Minnesota game, Jesse Fiorinelli, the general manager, um, was in the back of the room for his post-match press conference. That's not something we've seen before. With the other big wigs of the team, that the signals concern. You know, he is hedging to some extent. He's buying himself time. The results haven't been there. I think the performances are getting better, um, but he has to, to some extent, uh, be able to you know justify the project going forward and give the players and give the public belief that he is the right man uh, to lead this team and that you know they're they're making progress even though we haven't seen it I- I on the scoreboard yeah you, like the way that i look at this is you, you can justify the pressure you know there's enough evidence to apply pressure to this team to you know heighten the expectations for this team to actually put a good product on the field now the whole th- the, the you know this this rift of of certain fans and being against Almeida and Jesse Fiorinelli already or wanting them out or wanting Jesse out I I think is is a little not 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 thoroughly well thought of the, here's here's my take on this I I think without Jesse Fiorinelli obviously none of this happens we don't we don't have Almeida we we don't have you know. We don't have the the academy structure that the earthquakes mm-hmm. have been building for the last two years. Um, we don't have the, the the this exposure to you know to certain players, access to certain players to certain markets. You know, Jesse has uh, I I believe, and I, I'll, I'll stand by this. He has done some some things wrong in, in terms of building a roster, and, and noticeable of that is. Is you know the the limitations that Matias Almeida had to work with this off season, uh, but it's it's not it's not a hundred percent bad on his end. You know he mm-hmm. has done a lot of things right. Obviously, at the end of the day, soccer is a game of results, like any other like any other game. This team is expected to compete. This team is expected to succeed. The last seven years for the Earthquakes haven't been uh, the greatest, but you know Jesse has done things right. And it's going to take time. Uh, the patience, the patience part, is obviously thinning out. The question, like I've said before, now turns into: Well, how long is this process? Is Matias Almeida ready to live out his four-year contract? He says he is. Is he though? Well, that's the big question. Je- Jesse is the mastermind behind the technical side of the earthquakes operation, the, the, the soccer operations in San Jose. And right now, he has all of his eggs in Almeida's basket. After uh, uh, a season that I don't think anybody expected last year, his first season was was clearly a disaster under Stare. You know, he's making a big bet on Almeida. And, you know, the trouble with that is that, you know, Almeida has not given a long-term commitment to San Jose. When, when, um, when Jesse brought in Mikel Stare last year, you know, they were talking about building a long-term project. With Almeida, there's no such pretense. You know, it's clear that he's only here for a season, maybe two. I don't think I've ever seen before a coach no. uh, make the comments that he has that, that you know, a, a month or two after taking a job, he's talking about other job opportunities with the Argentine national team. Right. I, I would disagree. I, I would have to disagree. I, I'd have to say that Matias Almeida is is set on on the fact that he wants to be in San Jose. I mean, he's moved his family here. Mm-hmm. You know, he has he has everything going for him in San Jose now. He he brought in a contingent of 10, 10 plus people to work with him day in and day out. You know, I think that's what some some people you know could interpret it that way. You could spin it that way. You can say that okay, maybe Matias Almeida isn't going to be here for the long run because he's mentioning. But I mean, like he says it, who wouldn't want to go to Argentina if he was called upon? Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's 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 coaches in, in top flight leagues leagues in Europe. For example, as Jose Mourinho, if he would like to take the Portuguese national team job right before the World Cup, he'd probably jump on it as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a special experience. 
I'm sure Matias obviously holds Ar Argentina to dear to his heart. He, you know, played for the Argentine national team as a player. Almeida is committed to being in San Jose. There's no reason for him really to come to San Jose. San Jose is far enough out of the way that he's clearly here, you know, for a commitment, right? To, to build this team and to have another project that he's had uh, like that at River Plate in, in, in other places in Latin America to build a team, to build the team that struggled into a, a successful team, right? Um, I think it's more about thinking about how to plan for the future because you know, if he's only here, even if he's here for the full four years, um, you have to start thinking about you know, how, to, how to ramp up. When, when, you expect, when you expect the team, uh, essentially the expectations for the team and, and the promises um, that, that he has is bringing to San Jose. And, and you saw in his uh, press, conference, uh, press conferences that he's not willing to make any pro uh, promises at this stage, that he's, he's still sort of trying to figure it out. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention is to clarify what I was previously talking about. Mm -hmm. It's, it's I, I, I'm convinced that Matias wants to be a part of this project. Um, you know, whether he will see out the four years, like I said, it, it is, is, a, is an additional question. But my thing here is, is are the earthquakes going to be able to keep up with Matias's demands? Or <laughs> is it that, you know, Jesse and Matias have an agreement to where, or, or not, not necessarily an agreement, but does Matias understand the position that the San Jose earthquakes stand in, you know, that they're the the inferior market, that they they don't boast the same financial leverage that the LAFCs, that the the LA Galaxies, you know, obviously flash year in and year out. Does he know the limitations? Does he know the history of this team financially, uh, in in a market sense? You know, I I think. Eventually, if anything, that could probably lead to a certain departure is that is keeping up with with his demands, you know, on and off the field, the players that he wants. You know, just recently he, he mentioned to, to ESPN that he would like to bring in Mexican players and that one of them was Isaac Brizuela, but unfortunately he was too expensive. Well, I've been hearing on my end as well. Brizuela is not the only one that he was looking for. He also courted uh, Alan Pulido from Chivas. These are players that are far too expensive for San Jose that, you know, as we know it systematically are players that are only a dream mm -hmm. to everyone who follows this team. Those things are going to have to change eventually if that is that they want to keep, you know, going in the same direction. If they want to continue that upwards trajectory, these are the type of expectations. These are not only ha gonna have to be, you, you, these aren't only gonna be dreams, but they have to become reality. These, these things need to come to fruition. Right. And I think if that doesn't come, then potentially, hypothetically, Almeida will leave. Well, San Jose have never been a big spending team. And under this ownership, it's clear that they will never be a big spending team. The hitch, as you mentioned, is that Almeida's style of play, the aggressive man marking, uh, the ambitious style of play that he has, it requires a lot of talent, talented players to pull off. And, you know, they're going to have to have a very smart recruiting strategy to be able to, to find players who can fit that mold. Um, as he mentioned that he wants to bring in more Spanish players, you know, clearly nobody wants a coach to racially profile players. But Mexican, to have, Mexican, sorry, but Spanish Mexican speaking. Players, Spanish speaking players. Yeah. Uh, nobody wants to racially profile players, but to have a player that understands his style of play um, and, and won't have trouble with the language barrier. Uh, that will be crucial. And having players that, that, that can be able to play that kind, of, uh, that kind of style that he's bringing, which is, as you say, very unique and, and unique to MLS for certain, uh, will be key. And right now, um, you know, it's an open question as to whether the Quakes have the right players to do that. Yeah, speaking of transfers and all that jazz, uh, we did speak to Matias Almeida. We did mention that question to him after the game against Minnesota. Let's let's listen to what he had to say. No, nunca miro más allá del partido que viene. La vida es hoy. Mañana no se sabe qué sucederá. Entonces, lo más importante es tratar de revertir la situación lo más rápido posible. 
con tranquilidad, con paciencia y con mucha confianza. El exitismo es una parte de la cual no estoy a favor en la vida. El exitismo nos enseguece. Eh, el exitismo es para los débiles y nosotros trabajamos para ser fuertes. Eh, somos creíbles y, y como lo hacemos con amor, tarde o temprano el resultado va a llegar. He obviously mentions that he doesn't want to look past the next day, that nothing, you know, we're, we're not sure what can happen tomorrow. And also another little interesting piece there that he is not obsessed with results. Mm -hmm. What does that, what, what, what kind of thoughts does that leave you with, Alex? Well, I think it speaks to the fact that Almeida is more concerned at this point with performance. They're trying to work toward the style of play that is risky, so it might not immediately bring results, and that's why the team hasn't done well so far. But at the same time, it can lead to long-term yield. If, you know, it doesn't really matter where San Jose start at this point in the season. You know, I don't think a lot of people expect them to make the playoffs. You know, if Almeida is willing to say, hey, you know, we're more invested in this long-term project um, in about where we end up in, in a season or two, and they're willing to sort of uh, let some of these first games slip from their grasps, you know, in the in the process of trying to build up towards this uh, this style of play, um, then then that's that's a trade off they're making, right? It, it's about building up in the performances, and you've seen some from the from the performances so far. Um, I think from the, the from the first game, there were a lot of positives to take from it it's against Montreal. You know, a lot of players were saying that they saw a lot of the things that they were trying to implement in preseason with the pressing uh, and with the quick transitions and going forward. Against Minnesota, it's a different story, but um, you, know, you can see some of the, some of the, the processes unfolding in front of us uh, of them trying to, trying to implement these new changes. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say that he's, he's you know, trying to experiment with something new that he, is, he isn't used to. I mean, th this is a style that he's, he's really you know, carried with him since you know, his early coaching days at, at River Plate. He did it with Banfield, he did it with Chivas. You know, Matias Almeida isn't a, a tactician mastermind. He's really not. If, if you look at it in a wider scope, of th he's, he's, really, he's really not that Pep Guardiola. He, he's, not that, he's not that Mourinho, he's not that Klopp. You know, what Matias is known for is bringing the best of the players, you know, really, really you know, motivating them and, and captivating them in ways that they've never been before. And, and a lot of that has to do with him being a player and, mm -hmm. and with his life experiences as well. You know, he, he dealt with depression and, and he retired early at the age of 30. And I, I think he's lived, he's lived the life of a 60 year old, honestly, from, from everything that I've heard about him, from, from every, every you know, interview that I, I've seen him give is, is you know, he, he's, he's really, really, really mature mentally. And that's, how he's going to try and convince these players to play his style. That's not that's not to say that his style isn't effective, but you know, mm -hmm. Matias Almeida isn't isn't known for being that mastermind. Uh, with that said, you know, we we have been seeing hints and, and of you know his style of play taking over. And, and like you said, we're going to keep using this word process development. You know, these these are going to remain synonymous with the earthquakes for the entire year because, you know, like you said, I mean, I, I personally thought that the Earthquakes were going to, or I think, I still think the Earthquakes are gonna compete for maybe that sixth or fifth spot in the playoffs. A lot, obviously, depending on how the summer win transfer window goes, uh, but, you know, it, it's it's gonna take time. It, it's gonna take time and we, we go back, we're, we're sucked right back into this whole process and, and uh, you know, question and, and how long things are going to take um, but yeah he is prioritizing you know the style of play the execution of his play over the results and obviously a lot of that has to do with the you know, the, the limited pressure that there is in MLS the fact you know that the earthquakes aren't facing relegation mm -hmm. or any of that uh, any of that sort and I, I would say that Almeida's perspective uh, as a former player is one way in which he you know differs from Starre. Starre was not a former player. He, he had never played professionally um, at, at a high level. 
Almeida has. You know, last year you saw Starry, at some point, the, play, he, he, the players lost belief in him. They lost belief in each other, and they lost belief in what he was trying to do. Um, and, and the hope is that, uh, and it seems like at this point, Almeida has you know, reinstilled that sense of uh, passion for the game and, and belief in the players. The mood over preseason uh, was very positive. It seemed like the players got a lot out of uh, their trip to Cancun. Uh, and yeah. you started to see that in a three 0 preseason victory over LAFC. No, you, you also see it in the in the post game, and, and not not only the post game, but you know just the pressers all along. He's constantly challenging the players' egos and the players' mindsets, mm. asking for the players to wake up. You know, to to react to what he's trying to implement to react to the different scenarios that come about from certain games and from certain set pieces from really really minute details you know he he's really really trying to trigger the player and, and that's what he does you know that's mm -hmm. what he does and and at this time around opposed to when starry was here you know the players are actually giving him his respect the, the players are actually giving him their own time and giving in their own their own peace of mind. Where with Mikel Stare, you know, as we said, you know, a lot of people were convinced that he had lost the locker room, and they, you know, they, the players, and Mikel Stare, and everyone involved with the team, time and time again, said no, that they hadn't, that he hadn't lost the locker room. But but that was certainly the case. You know, this time around, things are much different. The players are animated. The players are are bought into the system. You know, it's gonna. It's it's only a matter of time, and that's that's what Matias Almeida has been saying too. You know, we do this with passion. We do this with with heart. You know, as the time goes by, the results will eventually come. Yeah, and I think some of the things that Almeida has brought in uh, have really you know allowed the Quakes players to look at their game from a different perspective. One of the things that's been talked a lot about. Uh, at least to us, uh, that the players have talked about is the amount of time that Almeida spends with film review and going back, comb combing through every detail from the match uh, so that the team can be prepared uh, for the next game. And I think that's something that we'll start to see the, the benefits from paying off down the line. Uh, you know, I don't think uh, I've ever seen anything like his, his training sessions either, at least from our perspective on the sideline. His training sessions, it's, it's sort of hard to find the method to the madness. Uh, but you can tell that the players are bought in and that he, he really has captured the minds of the locker room at this stage. And that can only yield positive re rewards going forward. Speaking of going forward, the Earthquakes are going to be taking on the New York Red Bulls at Red Bull Arena on Saturday. You know, obviously not an easy task on paper traveling to New York and taking on to one of the league's most formidable clubs in the Red Bulls, you know, a, t a team that is truly complete from top to bottom. They they have the academy, they they have the bigger name players like Kaku and they certainly have some of the 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 bigger and better pieces of uh, league players, right? In, mm -hmm. in Parker, in Long, uh, one of the younger guys in Etienne. They, they really do have a solid squad. Obviously, the, the results and, and their past triumphs don't lie. You, they, they've, they've made it far in CONCACAF Champions League. Just fell to Santos 4-2 to two yesterday mm -hmm. in that. But, you know, they have the depth. And Matias Almeida realized that this is not going to be an easy task for them. But first and foremost, let's listen to the words from Nick Lima, head of the San Jose Earthquakes match against the New York Red Bulls. Well, because, I mean, for one, we believe in each other. Um, and I think that's what's different right there. Um, the belief in each other, that we're going to fight for each other, um, as well as we have a, a proven successful guy leading us um, in Matias. And, you know, I, there's no need to panic. If, if you panic for you know, after two games and, you know, it, and you're never going to succeed anyway. Teams go through two-game losses, and especially in a new system that is completely new, I think everyone in this locker room, you know, after two games, again, you know, it, <laughs> I would be alarmed if, if we were alarmed. So, you know, we, we have a lot to learn clearly, and, and you know, I think the, obviously the best is yet to come. You hear Lima talking about the team's belief in each other, and they will need every 
last ounce of fortitude uh, this weekend uh, against the Red Bulls because if you know if the games against Minnesota and Montreal have been difficult, playing away at the Red Bulls uh, will be much, much, much harder task. Yeah, absolutely. I th- you know, we talked about this uh, just earlier. This isn't going to be easy. You know, if you look at the next five opponents for the San Jose Earthquakes, it could very well be that the Earthquakes won't leave with a single point in the next five matches. That that's that's the reality that this that this schedule is imposing on the Earthquakes. And that's you know, that, I'm I'm not here. I don't want to make that that you know announcement that the Earthquakes are going to go and start the season 0 and 7. But that could very well be the reality. You have the Red Bulls, then you have obviously the the preseason match against Monterrey, who are arguably Mexico's best team at the moment, which obviously doesn't matter, but (laughs) it's it's a good barometer test. And then after that, you have LAFC followed by Portland, and the list goes on. These are going to be tough, strenuous matches where you know the earthquakes are forced to win. If not win, then you know they're forced to at least steal a point. You know, game in and game out. They've they're, they're, they started the season uh, with zero points and, and are begun are also behind uh, in in the goal differential. It, it's it's not going to be easy. But you know, the difference is is like we were talking about last year. Is these players are are, are bought in. You know, they're bought into Matias Almeida's methodology. They're bought in within each other. They believe in each other. At least that's the way that. It sounds like I, we also talked to Aníbal Godoy today, earlier today, uh, and and he was saying, you know, that that their mentality is equivalent to where it was at before the season started. So, I mean, that that says a lot, you know, that that says that these players, you know, despite despite you know the the nil uh, zero to three lopsided performance, they are still, you know, committed and and, and are going to respond to the demands of Matias Almeida and the situation, obviously, which isn't great. It, yeah, that's part of the reason why it's such a bummer to have lost these first two games. Two home games to open the season against you know, teams that weren't leading the table last year presented a good opportunity to get points on the board and to make a statement and to prove to themselves that they'd overcome uh, the difficulties of last year and sort of the the plagues that consistently cursed them, uh, in terms of the mentality uh, and just a uh, Shea Silinus mentioned in preseason this this idea that they were the victims of victimhood. Um, the problem is now they're going into a tough stretch of games that that will take a lot of take a lot of mental fortitude to get through. Um, they're going to want to have to be able to find some positives from those games. You know, if you go and have another 3-0 loss against the Red Bulls, you know, it's, it's tough to see how the team recovers from that um, without you know, making some changes. Not much is changing for Nick Lima. I know we obviously opened up with this video called back into the U.S. men's national mm-hmm. team squad for their friendlies against Ecuador and Chile. Obviously is, is fully committed to what he's doing there. And, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about Nick Lima within this system. Mm-hmm. I, I know you wanted to mention it earlier. Uh, you know, has been really, really suffering in this. Uh, to me, he's been suffering mm-hmm. in this new system. Um, you know, he's he time and time again, he's been Matias Almeida's first sacrifice. He's just starving for the ball. I haven't seen him on the ball all that much. Mm-hmm. It seems like Matias Almeida is trying to emphasize his width on the left side because he has obviously uh, Vaco and, and Lopez both kind of interacting there more frequently than not. Where on the right side, Nick Lima gets engaged a bit, but he hasn't been emphasized as much as he was under Starry. Yeah, Lima has been fantastically successful for the national team uh, so far. He's been very strong, um, but that really hasn't translated into Almeida's system. I think. Part of the problem is that I haven't seen a lot of chemistry between him and Espinoza. Too often they're taking each other's space. Uh, they're not covering for each other, so you see Lima getting caught out too often. Um, and they're not building attacks down the right together. Both of them are very individually dangerous, but I think that uh, Lima hasn't been able to find where he fits in. There was a lot of talk made of uh, Lima playing a, more, more centrally on, on the attack, and you can sort of see how 
when the Quakes are building out of the back, he tucks in almost as a defensive midfielder. Um, but he hasn't been able to get on the ball much there, and I think that's part of the reason why Almeida has been introducing Tommy Thompson as one of the first subs consistently. That experiment needs to end, in, in my opinion. It, it needs to end. You know, the, the, I, Nick Lima was living through his mm. best moments just three, four, five weeks ago. You know, he was the talk of the nation. Nick Lima was, you know, being dubbed as the next star of the U.S. men's national team. Deservingly, by the way, deservingly, completely. And now you have him as, you know, Matias Almeida's first option off the pitch. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really correlate. I think someone should pinch Matias Almeida and let him know that he's got a starlet within the, the field, within that, that right back position. Well, the thing with Almeida's system is that it almost requires every player to be a midfielder. When you're tracking your man halfway across the pitch to the point where you have your center backs, you know, in the, in the opposition's box and your forwards defending in the box, players are caught out of position, so you sort of have to do a little bit of everything. And that's part of the reason why Tommy fits in, uh, is that he's able to drive through the middle, and when he tucks into the middle, he's able to find success. And I think that against Minnesota, you know, defensively, he might have been midfielder. suspect. Tommy's not a midfielder. Right, but, right, sorry. but he, he had success Ta going Tommy, forward in the middle. Tommy's not a right back. Down. He's not a wing back. Yeah, clearly he's not your starting wing back because he's not the optimal defender. But I think in those game situations, you know, it, it's been a smart sub so far. Fair enough. Speaking of the lineup, let's listen to Matias's words on possible lineup formations ahead of Saturday's game. La realidad es que todos los partidos son difíciles, teniendo en cuenta la temporada pasada. En realidad, all games are going to be difficult, keeping in mind the season that we had last year. Muchas veces creemos que los equipos con más nombre, con eh, más reconocidos, son los más importantes, pero en realidad son todos porque quedó a la vista los dos partidos que jugamos. Oftentimes we think that teams with bigger name, bigger signings are the hardest games, but Judging from the last two games, obviously every team is hard. Nosotros estamos tratando de hacer una mezcla de conseguir un estilo de juego. We're looking to find a mixture of looking to find a new style of play. Un equipo agresivo cuando no tiene el balón. An aggressive team when they don't have the ball. Un equipo con movilidad cuando la tiene. And a team with movement when they do have the ball. Y un equipo que está necesitado de sumar puntos. And a team that's in need to add points. El desafío es grande. It's a big challenge, pero no es imposible. But it's not impossible. Creo que el trabajo diario nos va a permitir ir mejorando cada día más. I think working daily will let us improve every day more. Somos conscientes de dónde estamos. We're aware of where we're at. Y y y y la manera que hemos arrancado el torneo. And we're aware of how we started the season. Puedo dividir un sistema de juego y un resultado. I can divide a style of play and a result. El resultado es el mismo que el torneo pasado. The result ahora. is the same as last season's for now. El sistema de juego ha ido variando a favor, creo. The style of play has changed in our favor, I think. Ya desde el momento que eh, empezamos a tener el control del part de los partidos. Uh, recently we've been having control of the games. A ese control le tenemos que agregar la agresividad para lastimar a Río. And now we have to add aggressiveness to hurt them while having that control. Pero bueno, eh, digo que paso a paso tenemos que ir creciendo en todo, en todo sentido y no, eh, no caer en la debilidad mental que porque no salga no va a servir. We have to grow step by step in every sense and not let um, a weak mindedness let us um, Insistiremos en nuestro juego, en nuestra búsqueda. We will insist on our, our style of play and what we're looking for. Por lo general, no, eh, lo, lo que marca mi historia como entrenador no ha sido de, de, de cambiar jugadores rápidamente. Generally, my history as manager, I haven't changed players quickly. Sino de poder darle un poco de confianza. I try to give them a little bit of confidence. Y ya donde veo que los errores se repiten, empieza a haber esa competencia de cambios entre ellos. And when I see repeated mistakes, that's when there's competition in between the players. You hear Almeida talking about how he doesn't want to make any premature changes. And that makes sense. The team still got to, you know, figure each other out and, and find their find their footing. However, I think there are a couple players who I would like to see more of. Uh, one of them is Danny Husen. Uh, you know, he had a short preseason while he was figuring out uh, his green card situation. Uh, now that he's back with the team and 
I, I'd like to see him better integrated uh, into the lineup. He's come on as a late sub, but uh, you know he hasn't gotten uh, many meaningful minutes so far in these first two games. Uh, and, and I think he has attributes uh, that could help the team in how, how they're looking to build through the attack. I think you know he offers physical size and pace. He offers a little bit of everything. Um, and I would like to see him get more, more minutes uh, looking forward. I couldn't agree with you more. Obviously, Danny Husen, and I've said this before, he was plagued by his whole green card process, you know, not being able to, to fully be there after they got back from Cancun from the preseason. He's a player that obviously brings in that different element when he's on the field. He's, he's very vertical, he's dynamic, he's technical, and he obviously has a niche for goal. You were able to notice that uh, just as soon as he stepped onto the field, he had that service from Chris Wondolowski mm -hmm. into the box and he put it right over the bar, but you know he's he's definitely a game changer and along with Danny Husen I think another player that the Earthquakes would really benefit from is another mainstay and that's Florian Youngworth uh, you know for for whatever reason you know internal reasons Florian Youngworth hasn't been able to really make a mark on Matias Almeida he hasn't been given a proper chance to to play he hasn't played at all well, you know my, my question would be where do you play him because I've been very impressed with uh, Judson in the middle I've been very impressed he is the linchpin back there you know he solves most of the dis defensive problems he's being asked to do a lot sometimes too much but I've been very, very impressed with him, uh, both in the defense and going forward. So where else do you play Flo? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't replace him for Jutson or as the, the Conte of MLS, as ESPN's Tom Marshall described mm. it on, on Twitter. But uh, I, w I would probably lean towards replacing him for Harold Cummings. Mm. I, I, I really like Florian Youngworth as a center back when he, when he did that, you know, a couple years ago. I, I thought he did well. I mean, he's he's nominally a, a number six player. Obviously, Jutson has that occupied for now. I, I would like to see uh, potentially, you know, maybe Jutson and Florian a, as, you know, double sixes, If that, but that doesn't that doesn't really apply. That wouldn't really function in an Almeida system. And you wouldn't, I, I wouldn't really stretch Florian and, and put him as an eight. He doesn't have mm -hmm. the mobility that maybe Aníbal Godoy has. And uh, Aníbal Godoy has been questionable this season. Uh, no, no, no question about it. I, but then again, so you're not really left with that many, uh, you know, options. So I, I would, I would uh, probably, I'm, I'm leaning more for for Florian to replace Cummings, if anything. Here, here's the problem: you like Florian as a center back. Florian does not like Florian as a center back. You know, he made it very clear last season that that was not his preferred position, right? He he is a natural six. Um, you know, I, at this point. I would assume that he would take any playing time that comes his way. Yeah, he's he's not left with many options either. Right, um, you, you, but as you say, I think you know Harold Cummings has to you know prove himself at this stage. I, I have been unconvinced so far. Um, on the third goal for Minnesota, his, his main attributes are his size and his aerial ability. He ducked out of that header and conceded an own goal at a key stage in the game. That was a big error to make and um, I, I think we need to see more from Harold going forward yeah well that does it for us uh, episode four alongside with Alex Morgan from Quakes Talk Alex you want to tell him a little bit about yourself uh, you know I, I know it took so long to to fully introduce <laughs> you but please for for the viewers for all the viewers tell them what you do and tell them where they can find the work that you've been doing so diligently for the past number of years sure yeah I I'm a beat reporter covering the earthquakes at Quakes Talk, quakestalk.com, and you can find me on Twitter at quakes underscore talk. Um, I've been covering the team, this is now my fifth season as a beat reporter, so I'm sufficiently jaded and cynical at this point, uh, but there are a lot of storylines to follow this season, and I'm glad to be a part of an awesome community of independent media outlets uh, following them. Independent we are indeed. Thank you so much for, for joining. Thank you guys for uh, watching and please stick around. We have a special podcast for you to listen to. We had Charles Woolen, our usual co-host, talk to the founder of Misplaced New York 74, Matt Wyke, live from New York.
All right, what's up? Welcome to a special edition of Black and Azul. This is a podcast version here, and I am joined by Matt Wyke of Misplaced 74. He's out in New York City. I got the chance to come out to New York City this week for work, so I thought, let's hang out with Matt. Let's talk about Misplaced 74, why they're misplaced, what they're misplaced about, and talk about his love for the San Jose earthquakes, his take on the season, and what is coming up next. What's up, brother? Thanks for having me. Excited to talk to you. Yeah, definitely. Excited for you to for to you to be a part and appreciate you tuning into Black and Azul. So tell me more about Misplaced 74. It kind of came across, you know, for your love of the quakes starting back in what, 2014? Yeah, like uh, it kind of fell on me being uh, that I live in New York and I've honestly never really lived in the Bay Area as a Quakes fan, um, which is pretty interesting, especially since, you know, I got a chance to watch him play at Bookshaw, um, and obviously I fell in love there. Um, so everything else after that has just been exciting, up and down, but exciting. Um, but yeah, I, I live in New York. Um, on the subreddit, I was able to uh, get together with a couple of fans who live here in the city and realized, you know what, I... I want to watch them play together every time they come to the city. Um, and, uh, yeah, every time the Quakes come here, we meet up, we go to games, um, and I'm looking forward to this weekend, actually. They're going to be here. And you watched the Minnesota, or excuse me, the game a couple of years ago with a, a friend from Misplaced 74 who, who watched the game to get into the playoffs. Is that correct? Yes. The, he, the Minnesota 3-2 game. Everyone recalls it. Everybody remembers it. 90th minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were in my little apartment. Um, he actually traveled a couple hours just to come watch it with me. Um, wow, White Plains, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it was thrilling. Uh, you know, I'm sure my neighbors were confused why we were screaming all of a sudden. Um, what an unforgettable moment, absolutely. You talked to me before we started this interview about what it's like supporting the Quakes from afar and then actually going to see the Quakes in person. What's the moment like? What's that kind of inner fire look like when you step foot at Avaya, put on your gear, see other people in their gear? I know it's just such a grandiose moment for you. It's, it's always surreal. Um, you know, being a Quakes fan in New York is a long-distance relationship, um, one that I'm absolutely committed to. And uh, I remember going to the Cali Classico two years ago and just so surprised and excited, and it felt surreal being around other Quakes fans. Uh, it was It's new to me. Seeing them coming to New York is something I look forward to all the time. Um, and they only, they're only here every other year. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's absolutely exciting and thrilling. You're finishing up a, an, another year of school, and then you somewhat have some sports marketing ambition. Uh, you know, what does that look like? What's the direction for you? Um, well, you know, I would love to work for the, the Quakes, actually, moving to the Bay Area uh, with my girlfriend. Um, that's where she's based. She's the one who got me into the club. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing up a year, um, and I've come to realize that that's something I do want to do, and maybe eventually running a women's club in, uh, in San Jose. That's something that I've dreamt about for a long time also. And, and why a women's club in San Jose? Well, obviously, they need the opportunity to do it. The Bay Area is a perfect opportunity for women to play soccer, um, and there's no reason they shouldn't be doing it. And with the help of the infrastructure that the Quakes have, it makes perfect sense. Um, and yes, this is a building time for the Quakes, but we don't know what it's going to look like in five years. It could be a bigger stadium. We could see a women's team. Who knows? With Miss Play 74, do you have constant contact with the other chapters, the one out in Arizona and Colorado? Yeah, um, I've, I've been able to message with um, the main Miss Play 74 in Colorado and uh, Gilberto in uh, Arizona. Um, and we kind of run things off of each other. We talk about it a little bit. Um, it's definitely a community. It feels good. Um, it's also very niche. I've got the sticker in front of me. You kind of told us a little bit about designing it. It was somewhat a little bit cookie cutter, but also at the same time, it's got your 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 own mark on it. The chevrons. You were a little bit nervous setting up the final piece. Can you can you uh, describe what's what's exactly going on on this on this logo here? Well, it's funny because I am nowhere near being a graphic designer. Um, so I took the the Quakes crest. Um, I found 
a font that looked pretty similar to it, and I took the overall feel of it, and I wanted to put the chevrons in the middle of it somehow, and the only thing on the website I could use was an X, so I used an X, kind of like the music I like, punk rock hardcore uh, in New York. So it kind of represents me as a quicksand. I love the sticker. I think it's a phenomenal little little brand. I think less is more here. You also attended the last game that Steven Lenhart scored in, and you're also from Jacksonville, where he's from mm -hmm. as well. Would you say he's your favorite Quakes player of all time, and what did the moment mean to you? This is a two-part question. Um, I wouldn't say he's one of my favorite all time, but I mean, everyone loves Lenhart. Absolutely. It's crazy. Yeah. Love it. Um, Do you have an extra wig? I forgot to bring mine today. I, I need one. <laughs> uh, you know what? We should go to Party City and get a couple wigs and uh, Let's do it. take a picture. But yeah, um, that was the first time seeing the Quakes on the road was that game uh, at Red Bull Arena. And I was sitting in the corner flag, near the corner flag, and my girlfriend and I started screaming as he scored the goal. And it was dead silent in the stadium. And it couldn't have been more awkward, but I couldn't have been happier. So. I love the moment. Do you have anywhere that you would like to see the Quakes play across the country if you don't get the chance to see them here? Is there any like, you know, plan or adventure that you have? Maybe, okay, I want to go see them in Toronto, or mm -hmm. let's go to Vancouver, or hey, yeah. you know, why not Dallas? Um, well, I mean, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I don't know. I, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like I've, you know, I've I've thought about definitely with you know all the hype around Atlanta being from the South, seeing that would be pretty cool, um, you know. Uh, but the closest we are is to Philly, uh, so next year I might have the chance to drive down there. Um, uh, maybe going to Chicago because we have any as family in Chicago, that would be fun to fun to see as well. I would love to travel the whole country because I'm overall an MLS fan. More, more so than I am anything else. Um, so I would love to see the Quakes in every city. Okay, switching gears now, a little, little bit of a subject that we talked about on Black and Azul last week mm -hmm. about NYCFC and its fans and the front office somewhat knowing about the fact that there were neo-Nazi fans kind of congregating with NYCFC and being involved there um, as a New Yorker and as a Quakes fan. What's your, what's your take? Um, Obviously, they should have done something about it sooner. Um, it's pretty crazy to think that the negligence that it took for them to not to do anything about it. Um, I'm glad they've come out and talked against it. Uh, I've never. I've been to many NYCFC games, and I've never seen anything racist or any neo-Nazi activity. Um, but you know, I we don't like want to like the same things as a neo-Nazi. We don't want to like the same things. We don't want to be a part of that. Um, so that's fine. Yeah, that's I think take. I think it's important to stamp out all hate in the game. And you know, again, like I said on the program, it's important to make sure that the league does too, and the clubs do uh, really, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your girlfriend and her background, inspiring you to become a Quakes fan? I know there's like some fam familial. Uh, links towards some players or someone new Donovan or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we watched the. I broke my foot actually in New York. We watched the in 2014. So we watched the whole World Cup together. I just stayed in bed and I watched soccer all the time. That, that sounds like a really good job. I I might want to borrow. I might want to break my foot sometime. Maybe or maybe definitely I don't, don't do okay. it in New York. It's not okay. fun. Not in New York. Um, okay. But if there's a World Cup on, Quakes are playing. That might be great. Um, <laughs> Uh, sandwiched in between. So yeah we, yeah, we took a trip to visit our family in the Bay Area. My sister lives in San Francisco. And we went to Buckshaw for a game. Um, and I knew, I, I knew of the Quakes. Her dad, her family, her brother, her sister, they all played soccer growing up. And her older brother played with Landon um, back when they were playing club soccer together. So there was some excitement around it. And the, every time we go to the city, uh, we get to watch them play with their family. So that's it's something really special for her to introduce me something like that. That's now such a big part of my life. 
And she, she comes from a soccer family, yes. correct? Yeah, she's played okay. soccer her whole life. So was she teaching you tactics about, you know, defensive center mid mm-hmm. and, you know, right wing and left wing and center forward and point everything, target man and center back about me. Yeah, everything about it. And, you know, like, she's like, here's the right back overlapping and things like that. Um, so it, it definitely opened up my mind, especially being a baseball fan. You know, soccer's my thing. It's probably easier having, you know, someone that you're, you know, in a relationship with or, or whatever, whatnot, kind of telling you the tactics compared to someone mm-hmm. on TV in a, in a way, kind of teaching you the game, sitting you down. It was personal. Yeah, it, it, the quakes have always been, you know, a personal thing for me. For sure. And how do people get involved with Misplaced 74? Is there a website yet? Is there just you on Twitter? What is the pitch? So it's pretty much me on Twitter, uh, but it's not just me. Uh, right. Misplay 74 New York is any Quakes fan who just so happened to be in the New York area. It, 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 it can mean that we go watch a game together. It can mean we could talk about the games together. Um, it can mean, you know, perhaps painting something together, bringing banners, doing graphic design, whatever. Um, I just want to watch the Quakes play, and I want to be with other people who love them just as much as I do. So if you go on Twitter, um, at Twitter, misplaced underscore New York 74, um, that's where we are are primarily. I have an Instagram with the same handle as well as a Facebook. The Quakes are in town this weekend against New York Red Bull. What time is the kickoff? 3.30. And if people want to hang out with you and do a little pregame, what yeah. do they do? Just reach out the same channels? Yeah, they should uh, send me a message or just tweet at me. Um, we're meeting up at Finnerty's in the East Village at noon, um, going to the stadium at 1. Um, you could take the path train there. And all Quakes fans are welcome to join us in 220. You heard it yourself. All Quakes fans coming through the New York area anytime, anywhere. He'll grab a beer with you, maybe a coffee. He could buy you a pastry or a scone. His name is Matt Wyke, and he absolutely loves the San Jose Earthquakes, building out the chapter Misplaced 74 from New York. My name is Charles Wollen from Black and Azul. This is a special, exclusive podcast. We appreciate our guest today. Thank you so much for tuning in and helping to grow the game of soccer in our country by tuning into this podcast. That is exactly what you're doing. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.